Dennis and Brenda Bowman were a married couple with two children from Holland, Michigan in 1989. They lived on the corner of Lincoln Road and 52nd Street. Dennis worked as a wood machinist and Brenda used to work at the jewelry counter at the Meyer department store. Their two children were Andrea and Vanessa Bowman. Andrea was born on June 23rd of 1974 as Alexis Badger. Her biological parents are Kathy Turkanian and Randy Badger. Before her first birthday, she was adopted by Dennis and Brenda Bowman and renamed. Vanessa was born in January of 1988. Andrea went from being an only child to more than a big sister. She was a third parent to the chubby redheaded baby. While other kids her age went to after school clubs and Friday night football games, Andrea stayed home changing diapers and cleaning bottles. On March 11th of 1989, Dennis Bowman contacted police. He told them that he had come home from his job to find 14-year-old Andrea missing. Dennis said that some of Andrea's belongings along with $100 from his dresser was also missing. He told police that Andrea was a troubled teenager who frequently fought with her mother and had run away to a friend's house once before. With no foul play suspected, the police labeled Andrea a runaway and passed her case along to the Youth Services Bureau. Few people who knew the Bowmans questioned the official narrative. Over the years, there had been whispers about the family. Once, when Andrea was in middle school, she boarded the school bus bleeding from her wrist. Some kids gossiped that she attempted to take her own life, but others said Andrea had cut herself trying to get back into her house after her parents locked her out. There were rumors that Dennis, a former Navy reservist with reddish-brown hair, a goatee, and wire-rimmed glasses, and Brenda, a portly woman with curled bangs, abused Andrea. But back then, what happened behind closed doors was considered family business. Many people in Holland assumed that Andrea had gotten so fed up with her home that she finally split. Maybe she'd gone looking for her birth mother. People heard that she'd hitched a ride to a local truck stop and had left town with an older boy or was pregnant. Brenda reported a series of tips in the weeks and months following her daughter's disappearance, all of which seemed to confirm that Andrea had run away. A single photograph formed most people's memory of her. It was given to the police when she first vanished. In it, Andrea is sitting against a blue studio backdrop and looking just off camera with her green eyes cast upward. Photos of missing children were often printed on the sides of milk cartons or on flyers taped to the top of pizza delivery boxes. Andrea's picture wound up somewhere else. In 1993, the band Soul Asylum debuted a music video for its song Runaway Train, featuring the images and names of missing kids across America. The video was a huge hit, with several versions airing on MTV and VH1. In the one that played in Michigan, Andrea's photo appears just after the two-minute mark. Reflecting on the video 20 years after its release, director Tony Kay claimed that more than two dozen missing children were found because of the video. Unfortunately, Andrea Bowman wasn't one of them, and her case went cold. The next major update in Andrea's case would come in 2010 when Carl Koppelman stepped in. Carl took an interest in true crime, which led him to web sleuths. It is a forum where crime hobbyists and armchair detectives connect and collaborate on unsolved cases. Carl spent countless hours scrolling through the national database of missing persons and unidentified bodies known as NAMUS. There is an overlap between the two main parts of the database, the disappeared and the deceased. Carl tried to match the characteristics of people who had gone missing with those of unidentified remains found. When Carl noticed that the age and condition of some of the bodies might make it difficult for loved ones to recognize them, it sparked an idea. 
He started creating lifelike renderings of Jane and John Doe's based on photos taken post-mortem. Some of the solved cases that we've covered on this channel before have been solved because of these renderings. Once he finished a rendering, Carl sent it to NamUs, and the database would sometimes publish it. He also posted his work on web sleuths so other armchair detectives could use it in their identification efforts. Eventually, Carl began working with police departments and the DNA Doe Project, which identifies human remains through genetic testing and genealogical research. Carl got interested in the case of the Racine County Jane Doe. She was found near the edge of a Wisconsin cornfield in 1999. She had been not alive for about 12 hours, but rain washed away any evidence that might have been useful to investigators. It seemed likely that the young woman's life was taken elsewhere and dumped. An autopsy determined that she may have been cognitively disabled and that she had suffered long-term abuse and neglect. She had broken bones and a cauliflower ear, and her body showed signs that she was assaulted. More than 50 people from the farming community where she was found attended her funeral. She was found wearing a men's gray and silver western style shirt, embroidered with red flowers. On NamUs, Carl plugged in some general search criteria, gender, age, location, and clicked through the results for missing persons. In most cases, the answer was a clear no. The age didn't match or the location made no sense, but one entry gave Carl hope. Andrea Bowman. Andrea and the Racine County Jane Doe shared physical characteristics and their ages aligned. Andrea would have been 25 in 1999 when the Jane Doe's life was taken. Holland, where Andrea disappeared, sits directly across Lake Michigan from where the Jane Doe was found. It's just four hours by car from one location to the other. Carl took his theory to law enforcement, who found it compelling enough to actually investigate. To determine whether the Jane Doe was Andrea, police would need to compare DNA from the body with that of someone in Andrea's family. Because Andrea was adopted, authorities had to track down her birth mother, which took a while. Andrea's birth mother is Kathy Turkanian. In 1972, at the age of 14, she ran away from her family. Kathy left Virginia where they lived and hitchhiked to Memphis, Tennessee, and she had no money. Kathy met 19-year-old Randy Badger. In December of 1972, Kathy and Randy traveled to South Carolina where it was legal for a minor to get married if they had parental permission. Kathy's parents gave it gladly because they did not want to be responsible for her at all. The couple were married less than a year when Kathy found out she was pregnant. On June 23rd of 1974, Kathy gave birth to a healthy daughter. She named her Alexis. When Alexis was five months old, Kathy and Randy separated and she went back to live with her parents in Virginia. Kathy realized she was going to receive no help from her family and couldn't give Alexis the life that she wanted to. Alexis was put up for adoption and was soon adopted by Dennis and Brenda Bowman. In April of 2010, police working on Andrea's case sent a letter to Kathy Turkanian's home. The letter explained that Andrea disappeared from her adoptive home and that she might be a Jane Doe found in Wisconsin. Police needed a sample of Kathy's DNA to know for sure. Kathy was willing to share her DNA, but she wanted to know more about what had happened to her daughter. In the letter it gave no details and Kathy didn't even know that her name was changed to Andrea Bowman. She searched online for information about missing girls in Michigan. It didn't take long to find one from the town of Holland, whose birthday and physical description matched Alexis's. When she saw the girl's school photo, 
Kathy thought Andrea Bowman could be her daughter. In her quest to find out more about Andrea, she connected with Carl Koppelman. While waiting for the DNA test results, Kathy also got in touch with a retired Michigan detective named Pat O'Reilly. Pat told Kathy that Andrea's adoptive father, Dennis Bowman, was responsible for her disappearance. Let's take a deeper look at Dennis and other crimes he committed. In May of 1980, a 19-year-old woman was riding her bike north of Holland, Michigan, when a motorcyclist forced her off the road. The man told her to get off her bike and walk into the woods. The young woman didn't move. The man pulled out a gun, fired a shot past her, and repeated the order. Still, she didn't budge. The man fired the gun again, this time at the ground near her feet. He said he would shoot her next. Just then, a car drove by, and the motorcyclist turned his head towards the noise and the young woman took the opportunity to pedal away as fast as she could. The man didn't shoot or give chase, and she was able to flag down someone in a pickup truck who drove her home. Her parents called the police, and the young woman provided a description of the suspect. A white male with tinted glasses and a blue helmet. His motorcycle, she said, had a black top case mounted on the back. By the end of the day, the police had detained a suspect. The young woman took one look at him and confirmed that he was the man who tried to attack her. It was Dennis Bowman, who by then was already a husband and a father. At the time, Andrea was almost six years old. Dennis was convicted of assault with intent to commit criminal conduct and sentenced to five to ten years in prison. He was referred for psychological counseling, and a judge determined that he would likely pose a danger to women if he was free. Still, Dennis served the minimum sentence. One day in 1998, a state trooper in Door, Michigan, responded to an alarm at the mobile home of 28-year-old Vicki Vanden Brink. She'd reported so many break-ins that the sheriff's department had installed a security system. When the trooper arrived at the scene, he found Dennis Bowman walking away from the back door. The Bowmans had moved to Hamilton, a town nestled between Holland and Door. In 1989, Shortly after Andrea's disappearance, Dennis told the officer he was temporarily staying with Vicki Vandenbrink, who was a former co-worker of his. He was let go, but when authorities got in touch with Vicki, who wasn't home when the alarm went off, she said Dennis was lying. Dennis then changed his story, telling law enforcement that he'd entered the trailer to use the bathroom. He'd been there at least once before, he claimed, when his daughter Vanessa wanted to sell Girl Scout cookies to Vicky. Skeptical, the police obtained Dennis's permission to search his property. In the loft of an outbuilding, they found a black duffel bag containing lingerie that was later identified as Vicky Vanden Brinks, as well as a short-barreled shotgun, a black sweatshirt, and a mask. Kathy Turkanian learned the details of Dennis Bowman's criminal record after submitting a Freedom of Information Act request based on what Detective Pat O'Reilly had told her. After seeing what he did to other women, Kathy became convinced that Dennis Bowman took Andrea's life. If Kathy was right, it would mean that the Racine County Jane Doe wasn't Andrea. That theory made sense only if Andrea was still alive 10 years after she disappeared. In 2013, the long-awaited DNA results confirmed it. Kathy was not related to the Jane Doe. In September of 2013, Kathy and Carl met in person at the Missing in Michigan conference. Organized by the state police, the conference was designed to raise awareness about and hopefully generate leads for cold cases. Kathy and Carl showed up in custom shirts they made that read, Find Andrea Bowman. Carl scanned the room and was surprised when his eyes landed on familiar faces. 
He nudged Kathy, and she looked over. That's Vanessa, she said. And that's Brenda. Brenda recognized Kathy because she saw that Kathy said on Facebook that she believes Dennis is responsible. Brenda seemed eager to explain her side of the story. She insisted that she and Dennis had fully cooperated with police after Andrea's disappearance. She presented a binder full of notes and missing persons flyers as proof. She recounted sightings of Andrea. It was clear she still believed that the teenager had run away. According to Carl, when he brought up Dennis's criminal record, Brenda replied, I haven't forgotten what he did, but I do forgive him. I take my marriage vows very seriously. After the conference, Kathy hired a private investigator named Jeffrey Floor. He managed to get his hands on Andrea's police file, which Kathy and Carl had never seen. Oddly, the earliest documents in it were from March of 1989 when Andrea disappeared. They were dated four months earlier. That was when police responded to allegations of abuse in the Bowman home. The report did not go into detail about what happened, noting only that local authorities had determined that the allegations were not true. Carl and Kathy were sure that law enforcement had missed something. In 2017, Kathy and Carl met up with Chris Haverdink, the detective who'd taken over Andrea's case. Haverdink agreed that Bowman was suspicious, but that wasn't enough to arrest him. On November 22nd of 2019, Dennis Bowman was arrested by the Allegan County Sheriff's Office. But not because of anything to do with Andrea. He'd been arrested in relation to a crime committed nine years before Andrea disappeared, more than 800 miles away from the shores of Lake Michigan. Bowman was arrested because he apparently took the life of Kathleen Doyle in 1980. 25-year-old Kathleen had been stripped gagged, strangled with an electrical cord, then assaulted and stabbed. Investigators collected male DNA from her body, but had few leads until Henry Lee Lucas was arrested in 1983. Lucas claimed that he and a partner named Otis Toole were responsible. His confessions were later revealed to be false and the charges were dropped. Eventually, Science caught up with the case. Genetic genealogy, which compares unidentified DNA with a huge number of samples stored in databases, was becoming a very popular way of investigating these cold cases. Norfolk investigators partnered with Parabon Nanolabs, a leader in the field, to test the DNA collected at Kathleen's crime scene. Soon, Based on genealogical research, they had a list of more than 30 suspects. In 2019, after some more testing and police work, it led investigators to Dennis Bowman. Bowman was extradited to Virginia to stand trial. By then, he had already confessed. He admitted to entering Kathleen Doyle's home through a back window. He claimed that he was drunk and that it was an attempted robbery. He said he didn't expect to find Kathleen in the house and that he didn't plan to take her life, but she was in the house and he did take her life. At the time, Bowman was in Norfolk for his annual two-week service in the Navy Reserve. He was also out of jail on bond. He was awaiting trial for the attempted assault of the 19-year-old Holland woman, the one he fired a gun at before she escaped on her bike. Kathy learned that she'd inadvertently played a role in solving Kathleen Doyle's case. Jeffrey Floor, a private detective, told her that at some point the Bowmans had visited the Allegan County Sheriff's Office to report Kathy for harassment. They claimed she was making defamatory accusations about Dennis online. 
Investigators offered Dennis a bottle of water and kept it when he left. According to Floor, that was how his DNA came into their possession. In the first week of February of 2020, with a thick layer of snow blanketing the ground, police returned to the Bowman's property. There was a forensics team on site this time, with a crime scene tent and dogs in the backyard. Officials appeared to be concentrating on one area in particular and they had started to dig. Later that day, the police held a press conference. They announced that human skeletal remains had been found and that they likely belonged to Andrea Bowman. The police needed to confirm that it was in fact Andrea. Kathy provided her DNA immediately. In March of 2020, almost 31 years to the day after Andrea disappeared, the results came back. There was a DNA match. Dennis claimed that what happened to Andrea was an accident. He said that they were arguing and he slapped her, causing her to fall and break her neck. He reported her missing to cover it up. That was the story that he told Brenda in correspondence from prison. In June of 2020, Dennis received two life sentences plus 20 years for taking the life of Kathleen Doyle. He was legally ordered to serve his time in Michigan where he would stand trial for what he did to Andrea. The first hearing was held in February of 2021. Brenda took the stand first. She tearfully recounted how she'd made missing persons posters because she really believed that Andrea had run away. She said she learned the truth only after Dennis was arrested in the Kathleen Doyle case. When she was asked whether Andrea had ever accused Dennis of abusing her, Brenda said yes, but that she didn't believe the allegations were true. That's a lie, she told Andrea, and you know it. It was Brenda who told police where to find Andrea's remains. In a call from prison, Dennis had confessed to burying their daughter in the backyard. Brenda said she didn't believe him at first. They hadn't lived in their house in Hamilton when Andrea's life was taken, so how could he have buried her there? To Brenda's horror, Dennis explained that he'd moved their daughter's body to the new property as soon as they signed papers for it. The cement slab in the yard was the headstone of a grave that Brenda never even knew was there, in the shadow of the house she and Dennis shared for nearly 30 years. He didn't lie this time, Brenda told the detective when Andrea's remains were found. He didn't lie. As other witnesses took the stand, Dennis sat quietly in a green shirt, bow tie, and face mask. On December 22nd of 2021, Bowman pleaded no contest. He was sentenced to an additional 35 to 50 years in prison for taking Andrea Bowman's life. Bowman confessed to an assault from 1979. The crime was featured on the front page in the Holland Sentinel published October 18th of 1979. The article detailed a very violent attack on a 27-year-old woman who early on a Sunday morning was bound, gagged, and assaulted by an intruder in her home. The perpetrator took cash before fleeing the scene and was described as a white man between 25 and 30 years old with sandy hair and wire-rimmed glasses. He was estimated at 5 foot 6, 150 pounds, and according to the young woman, her assailant was wearing a leather jacket and dark pants. The newspaper published a police sketch of the suspect, his ink-blotted pupils staring blankly from the front page. According to the lead detective in the case, there had been a recent uptick in reports of prowlers in the neighborhood where the crime had occurred. Police suspected that the attacker might have committed other crimes. This potentially means that there are a lot more cases that could be tied to Bowman. For those wondering, the Racine County Jane Doe was later identified as Peggy Johnson. Peggy was never reported missing. 
She was last seen at a homecoming dance in Harvard, Illinois in 1994. Most people who knew her assumed that she had just run away. An aunt worried enough to take out a classified ad in the paper, but nobody seemed to suspect that something terrible might have happened to the auburn-haired girl. Peggy disappeared shortly after her mother passed away, the sole parent in her low-income household. The 19-year-old found herself orphaned and homeless with a developmental disability that made it difficult for her to get a job. By chance, she met a nurse named Linda LaRoche who offered her work as a live-in housekeeper and nanny to her children. The teenager jumped at the opportunity. But over the next five years, LaRoche abused Peggy Johnson, beating her, starving her, and forcing her to live in a crawl space. The violence culminated in 1999 when LaRoche allegedly ended 23-year-old Peggy's life and dumped her body in Raymond, Washington. No one could identify her, so she became known by the place where she was found, the Racine County Jane Doe. 20 years after Peggy's life was taken, Wisconsin police received a tip from a concerned citizen about a nurse who confessed to taking someone's life who worked for her in the late 1990s. In early November of 2019, Racine County authorities announced both Peggy's identity and LaRoche's arrest. In May of 2022, a judge in Racine County sentenced Linda LaRoche to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She was also given an additional five-year sentence for hiding Peggy's body. Peggy's step-aunt, Jenny Schroeder, had this to say to LaRoche, I hope you have a slow, slow, miserable time in your cage. <laughs>